Hey everybody, welcome to All Team Academy. I am your host, Zach Peterson, also your local technical consultant for All Team. And today we are gonna go over two important digital protocols that are used in most integrated circuits. And those protocols are I2C or Inter-Integrated Circuit Protocol and SPI, Serial Peripheral Interface. So these two protocols are very common and what we want to do in this video is look at how they are implemented on a PCB and some of the factors that influence their operation. So that's what we're going to get into today. Let's go ahead and get started. So to get started, let's take a look at I2C. So we're not gonna look at the signaling format or the addressing format or anything like that, but really I wanna look at what happens on the PCB. So if you are inside your schematic and you're gonna wire up two components with an I2C bus, you'll see two signals coming off of the main controller. So the first is serial data or SDA, and then the second one is serial clock or SCK. These two signals essentially come out in this kind of topology. So here we have let's say an ASIC, so this is one of our peripherals, and we're pulling data directly off of this line, we're pulling the clock directly off of this line. And then we could go down to another ASIC over here, let's say, this is gonna be ASIC number two, and it's also gonna do the same thing. It's gonna pull data directly off of this line, pull data directly off of this line. Pretty simple. So this is one of the things that makes it so easy to wire up in a schematic as well as on a PCB. You can essentially just pull signals right off of these main buses and pull data directly into your peripheral. Once you actually have this wired up like this, there are some things you have to do because of the way that an I2C protocol works. So I2C works as an open drain protocol. So if we look at the clock signal just as an example, inside of the controller, you have what is essentially a transistor. You have this end connected back to ground. And then there's a control signal here that toggles the transistor on and off. Now, when the transistor is toggled on, what it's gonna do is it's going to pull all of the charge off of this bus and dump it into ground. Now, all of that charge that is given to this line comes from a power bus. So each of these lines is also connected up here to a power bus. And this could actually be built into this component um, but that's not very common at all. Normally it's just like this with some pull-up resistors. So the reason that you have these pull-up resistors is because you are pulling up the maximum voltage of these lines up to whatever the power bus voltage is. But these resistors will then limit the current that flows through this bus and in the ground when this transistor is toggled on. So when this transistor is toggled on, the current path is essentially like this, when it's toggled off, the current path is essentially like this, wherever, wherever the destination chip is. So it essentially goes over here like this. So the next thing that we wanna look at is what determines the rise time for signals on this bus. Because as you know, with digital signals, the rise time of that signal will then determine whether or not we need to implement this bus on a PCB with some of the standard high-speed digital design practices. Well, as it turns out, it's not just the resistors that determine the rise time on the bus. There is also some bus capacitance back to ground for both of these lines. So this line also has this open drain configuration and it has some bus capacitance, which we can label C sub B. So the total capacitance on the bus, C sub B, multiplied by whatever the value of this pull-up resistor is, is going to give us a time constant. So if you're familiar with RC circuits, you know that they have a time constant. And so the rise time is going to be proportional to this term here, this RC value. These values could be on the order of anywhere from, let's say, about 100 nanoseconds all the way up to a microsecond. So these signals are actually quite slow. So because these signals are quite slow, in most cases, you actually don't need to worry about doing anything like impedance matching on this type of bus, and you don't have to design this bus with controlled impedance at 50 ohms or any other particular value. So that's one of the things that makes I2C so easy to use in a PCB. So just because this bus is running at rise times of say 100 nanoseconds 
or up to one microsecond in the longer case doesn't mean that it's impervious to crosstalk. I2C buses can still receive crosstalk just like any other trace in your PCB. So if you have a trace running nearby that's carrying a fast signal, that signal can still inject noise into the traces on your I2C bus. So just to summarize, with these I2C buses, you don't necessarily have to worry about impedance and you don't have to worry about matching. We don't have to worry about any of that. And so because of that, it's very easy to lay this out and route this. And I've even read some accounts on forums and like on Stack Exchange of people saying that I2C is pretty difficult to route incorrectly. So next, let's look at the SPI protocol. So in SPI, I have my controller here. It has at least three pins coming off. So if you just have one peripheral, you only need three pins. But in general, there will be four pins or at least four pins. So here we have our master in slave out. We have our master out slave in. And then we have a clock, SCK, sometimes SCLK, just depends which data sheet you're reading. And then we have a set of CS pins. So the CS pins, there could be more than one pin. You could also toggle some other peripherals using GPIOs as chip select pins. In this controller, I'm then going off to, let's say this is gonna be peripheral number one, and we'll have, let's say another one down here, peripheral number two. Now in this case, these can just route straight across. And then we also pull off on each of these signals, and then we go down here to peripheral number two. Now the chip select pins, you could actually have chip select number one, chip select number two, whatever the case may be. And that chip select pin is just gonna go to each one of these peripherals. And that is how you select which of these two peripherals is supposed to receive this data and then do something with it and then give a reply back into these different pins. So the master in, slave out, this is your input onto your controller and the rest of these are all outputs. And that's how this peripheral works in terms of its topology. Now, SPI can run at much faster data rate. And in fact, if you look at some data sheets for some components that have an SPI interface built into them, you will again see that the rise times can be much faster. Now, the rise time on this SPI bus is going to be determined by the load capacitance that's connected to each one of these lines. So what is load capacitance? In these destination components or in these peripherals, their inputs are capacitive inputs, and that capacitance has, acts like the load on each of these lines. So that load capacitance will determine the rise time of a signal operating on this bus. And if you look at some data sheets, you'll actually see numbers down on the order of like one or two nanoseconds. Now the rise time on an SPI bus doesn't necessarily work the same way as it does on an I2C bus. SPI buses are push-pull topology. So they have a push-pull driver integrated into each side of the bus, and that push-pull circuit is essentially just a CMOS buffer. So it's not like an open drain configuration with a control signal. That push-pull uh, circuit can actually source a very fast signal depending on the value of the load capacitance that's connected to the bus. So each of these peripherals has an input on this side of the bus that is capacitive and it has what we call some load capacitance. So some values that you might see in a data sheet are maybe like 50 picofarads, something on the order of picofarads. So the rise time for signals on the SPI bus are gonna be proportional to this load capacitance, we'll call it uh, C sub L. So this load capacitance will determine the rise time. And if you look in data sheets for a driver component that has an SPI interface in it, what you'll actually find is you'll find a rise time value that is specified for a given load capacitance. So some example values that you might see are something as small as like one nanosecond, which will be specified for a load capacitance of let's say like you know 50 picofarads or something like this. So they will give you a few different values and they'll pair those up. It's basically your job as a designer to know what the load capacitance is on your bus in order to then determine what the rise time is for the signals that are being sent out on this bus. So what this all means is that if we have a larger load capacitance, meaning that we just make the bus larger, 
or we're using components that have a larger load capacitance, or maybe we have more components, so we have multiple load capacitances in parallel, we're increasing this load capacitance, it's gonna take longer to charge in general, and that means our rise time is going to go up. We're gonna have a longer rise time. Now, because you can see values like one nanosecond rise time in data sheets for kind of an arbitrary load capacitance here, it's natural to start thinking that SPI is going to start to need high-speed design practices like controlled impedance and termination. So one question that is actually quite common out there is whether or not you should actually do this. So the first thing to note about the SPI protocol is there isn't an actual impedance specification. And so what I mean by that is if you look in like a data sheet or you look in an application note or you look online on forums, you may see people say that SPI needs to have controlled impedance. However, there is no specific impedance value that you have to design to. So in other words, there's no standard here forcing you to make each of these traces on this bus 50 ohms. So contrast that with something like, let's say USB. USB has a specific impedance requirement. You have to size those traces and space them out such that you hit specific impedance values. That's not the case with SPI. You have a little bit of freedom to design the bus in order to hit your requirements if you happen to be operating in this regime where this bus is so long that you then need to implement termination. So in general, the output impedance here at this side of the bus is gonna be low. It's gonna be maybe 10 ohms to maybe 30 ohms. And it really depends on the drive strength of the signals that are being sourced here and then the current. And then using those values, you can figure out approximately what this output impedance is. Now, let's just suppose for a moment that you're operating on a bus that has a one nanosecond rise time in the extreme case, and you've designed your PCB such that it's large enough that this one nanosecond rise time forces you to then implement high-speed design practices because these traces are now acting like transmission lines. Well, then in that case, you would need to put some series resistors here. Now, this is actually pretty uncommon. And one thing that I've seen in some design guidelines is the statement from different designers and even from some application notes saying that you should always put these series resistors here and you would actually put them at the driver. So this one would actually go back here. And then same thing with this meso signal. It would actually go back here. So these would be your series termination resistors. What these things do is they not only match impedance, assuming that you've designed this trace to a specific impedance, but they actually slow down the bus. And so it's a little ironic that these series resistors not just match impedance, but by slowing down the bus, they create a situation where you no longer really need the impedance control. So the main point of putting these series resistors here is actually to slow this down and to get you to a situation where this is no longer acting like a high speed bus. So instead of one nanosecond here, typically you may find a, let's say 22 or 33 ohm series resistor here on these outputs. And then that could bring your one nanosecond rise time up to maybe something like 10 or 20 nanoseconds. So then in that case, the signal is gonna be much slower. It's gonna create much less crosstalk, has the additional benefit of on a very long bus, having impedance matching here right at this interface between the output side of this resistor and then the rest of the trace going on to the rest of the bus. So the takeaway from all of this with SPI is just to be careful. If you see someone saying that you have to use impedance matching or that you have to route it with controlled impedance, they don't always actually state what that specific impedance value is. So just be skeptical of those guidelines and remember that half the reason you place these series resistors is to slow down the signal. Now you don't wanna slow down the signal too much because if that signal rise time starts to violate setup and hold times at the receiver, the logic circuit in that receiver is not going to toggle properly and the bus may not work at all. So be careful of that. Don't use too large resistors here because they do slow it down too much to the point where the receiving component can't read data and can't read the clock signal anymore. So we have some great resources linked in the description. You can find a couple of articles that describe this issue with trace impedance on SPI buses. Also, we've got a great guide from Mark Harris linked in the description that goes over the signaling format used in SPI buses. And for those of you that are gonna be programming any drivers that then need to operate over an SPI bus, 
uh, that is going to be a great resource for you. So I encourage you to check out both of those resources. All right. Thanks everybody for watching this video. Make sure to hit that subscribe button, hit that like button. If you have any questions on this, don't hesitate, leave them in the comments section. We love getting your questions and comments. And of course, you can send your questions and comments over to YouTube at altium.com. We get a lot of questions and comments, but I always make sure to check YouTube at altium.com for any of those that need to come straight to me. Okay, thanks again, everybody. And last but not least, don't forget to call your fabricator, folks.